what are the most weird and out-of-pocket scenes in Cormac McCarthy novels? Because in almost every single McCarthy novel, there are weird sex scenes that either involve incest or underage sex or very odd situations. And today we are going to focus on McCarthy's Southern novels, which are criminally unread. And many people believe that his Southern novels are better than his Western novels. And there is so much to talk about. I will have to break up this series into two videos and I will release the Western novels version tomorrow. But I'm happy to get back to some fun literary analysis after all of the gossip. And if you don't know, my name is Ian and Right Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to Cormac McCarthy. In the playlist down below, you will find over 190 videos analyzing McCarthy's books, his life, and his writing philosophy. But let's hop into it, everyone. And I'm not going to share any important spoilers that have any relevance to the plot, at least with this first book, McCarthy's first novel, The Orchard Keeper, which I guarantee most of you guys haven't read. And McCarthy opens up the show, his, in, his writing career, in a very odd way because in one of the first actual scenes of the novel, a character named Marion Silder is driving his muscle car in the dark woods of Tennessee in the 1930s with his buddy. And on the side of the road, they see two I assume underage girls because one of the characters calls them youngins. And this character is only 23 years old. And so they get in the car and Marion starts driving fast and hard through the woods. And McCarthy somewhat implies that these girls have never been in a car before, which shows probably their young age because one of them is so scared that she pees her pants and it gets all over the seat. And instead of saying, oh my God, what a terrible thing has happened. Let's get you straight to Knoxville where you need to go. They stop at a black church and one of the men takes the girl who Peter pants to the shit house and has sex with her. And this is how McCarthy describes it. Quote, you mean to say you, Silder paused for a moment trying to get the facts in summary, you screwed her in a N-word, hard R, shit house, sitting on the dot, dot, dot. And so there's the opening of the show, everyone. Most likely underage sex with a girl who Peter pants in the outhouse of a black church with an N-word hard R as a cherry on top. And so next we have kind of a weird, almost underage sex scene and fantasy between the characters John Wesley Ratner and Juanita Tipton in The Orchard Keeper. And this has nothing to do with the plot and this love story goes nowhere. And Juanita is very similar to Wanda, which is another underage woman that McCarthy uses in Suchery that we are, we are going to talk about in a little. And Juanita asks John Wesley, hey, what are you doing? He says, just messing around. And this is what she says. And we would be here all day, but McCarthy has already described her breasts. And I should also say that all of this stuff is actual, very, actually very subtle characterization from McCarthy. I'm not sitting here and judging him or rebuking him for doing this. I am just pointing all this stuff out because I have memorized all this stuff because I have read all of Cormac McCarthy's novels at least 10 times. The tips of her breasts were printed in the cloth like coins. She was watching him watch. You ain't supposed to mess around with yourself, she told him, part of a smile at her mouth corner mouth corners and eyes squinting in mischief. And throughout this scene, Juanita... And that sounds like, you know, anyway, she's trying to convince John Wesley Ratner to have sex with her because the Tiptons are kind of known as this very low class family who just has a bunch of babies. And it kind of reaches its penultimate moment when she forces him to remove a leech from her and she's already, her whole dress is wet. Obviously it's white. We've heard it's white. So it's see-through and McCarthy has described that she has these big breasts and this is what happens at the end. The huge expanse of flesh and the bloomers. And if we look here, the, he's talking about her boobs here with the expanse of flesh because of the water and the bloomers are her underwear and her holding him by the collar with her feet somehow in the water on either side of him until he jerked away with his shirt ripping loudly and splashed back through the creek to the bank and out across Saunders Field. And so this shows Ratner's immaturity as a young man that he isn't willing to have sex yet. But that's just kind of a weird scene. And when you read it, it is very sensually written, and there are a ton of details that I'm just not going to go over here. And so next we have McCarthy's second novel, Outer Dark. And I don't think I'm actually going to spoil anything that you can't find on the back cover of the book or just the general description of it. But Outer Dark is about a brother and sister, Cola and Renthe, who sleep with each other, or I should say have sex with each other, and eventually have a baby with each other. 
And so incest is a huge theme in McCarthy novels. And so that in and of itself is weird. And this is McCarthy most likely relating back to his personal life where he was feeling feeling guilty about what happened with his first wife because the first draft of Outer Dark was composed, or excuse me, was started the idea for Outer Dark and the first words that were put down on paper because Outer Dark is the only first draft of a Cormac McCarthy novel that is available in the archive, like the actual first draft. We have from first to last draft there. But the month he started it is the month that his wife decided to leave him with his first child, Colin, which is very similar to Cola, the main character of the novel. And the main theme throughout the novel is guilt. And obviously McCarthy was feeling guilty. He was young. This was the first probably big relationship that it imploded on him. He had a child. But also kind of the incestual theme most likely stems from the fact that he went off into the world. He went into the Air Force. He lived in San Francisco for a while. He considered himself from the start a genius. When he sent in the Orchard Keeper to Random House, he said that this is absolutely perfect. When they said, hey, we're going to send you an advance right now and sign a deal with you, he said, well, and the, but they were like, we need to change some stuff. He's like, you don't have to change anything. And they had to negotiate to be able to change things with him. And so I feel like him marrying a girl, a woman, I should say, who was a, like, what, five or six years younger than him, who was from his hometown, stifled him because McCarthy did have an, an did have an eye excuse me for the exotic and the taboo his second wife was a ballerina from Europe his third wife was 40 something years younger than him we know about his relationship now with Augusta Britt who was either 14 or 16 depending on what or 7 16 depending on what account you believe or it, depending on if you believe that there were multiple girls teenage girls he took to Mexico And so I could get into my theories on incest, but let's move to another weird scene in the novel, which most people miss, actually. And in this scene, Cola, the main character, is being a voyeur and masturbates to a woman. And McCarthy does so many tricks here to hide all of this. And so he is painting a roof and can see a woman, but she can't see him. Through the haze of heat rising from the roof, he watched a girl come and go. And I shouldn't say woman. He uses uses the word, word girl here. Girl come and go from the house with washing, watched her move along the line in the yard, stooping at her basket and reaching up, and the shape of her breasts pulling against the cloth. Paint seeped from the uplifted handle down his poised wrist. He scraped it away with one finger and slapped the paint out of the butt of the brush. He watched her go in again. And if you were like, what the hell did I just read, Ian? That's not a masturbation scene. This scene has been talked about ad infinitum by McCarthy scholars, and from what I can tell, most of them would agree that masturbation is what's happening here. And, and I'm going to now talk about John Vanderhyde or read you guys John Vanderhyde's explanation of this. But Diane Luce, Nell Sullivan, and Fisher Worth and others have also talked about this scene. Quote, the uplifted hand of Cola Holm grips figures his erect member, the seeping paint his wasted seed. Moreover, the narrative seems to give voice to Cola's sexualized perception of the girl, whom he watched and watched and watched, by attributing to her breasts a peculiar agency of their own. Rather than being pushed against the cloth of her dress, we read that they pull against it as if they actively wanted to expose themselves to Cola's intent gaze. Or I should say expose, excuse me. This imputed agency would be in keeping with the economy of the masturbatory fantasy, the willingness attributed to the spectral partner in the concocted, diegetic scenario is part of the efficient cause of the real autoerotic arousal. And there is an entire article called Old Fevery Chill of Some Kind by John Vanderhyde that goes into this for pages and pages and pages. And so without really spoiling anything else, there is cannibalization and heavy violence and other oddities that I won't really talk about here in Outer Dark. And weird enough, in the early versions of Outer Dark, like Cola ends up in a tree at some point um, in the early draft shots, I should say. And he's like li- living in this tree and like dreaming all of this. Like it was, it started off as a really weird kind of very postmodern idea. And eventually, you know, McCarthy thought we got to get Cola out of this tree, but that's a whole other story. And so we are now going to talk about McCarthy's most read Southern novel, which is Child of God. And the weirdness is everywhere in this novel. But when I was at the archive, I want to tell you guys something that was in the earlier drafts and made it for a while. At some point, Lester Ballard decides to castrate himself and cut off his own balls somewhat randomly. And Albert and, and McCarthy had had this in here for a while. And Albert at, or, or Erskine commented back and basically said, what the hell is wrong with you? Why is this happening? But I mean, obviously Outer Dark is about a necrophiliac. It has elements of voyeurism in it. 
the way McCarthy writes about all this in detail, but also the weird, but also in the weird simplicity of Lester Ballard's simple mind is insane. And I should note really fast also that this stuff isn't out of pocket or weird in the time of, you know, when a lot of these novels were set, which is anywhere from, you know, Outer Dark, probably near the turn of the 20th century to Child of God, Suchery and the Orchard Keeper, which ranged from like 1930 to like 1950. Excuse me, Child of God was set in the 60s. And so underage sex and all this stuff was very normal in the South and sadly kind of is still today. And I would say out of anything McCarthy has ever released, he would want to distance himself from Child of God because it was a quick way to cash in some money because he was so broke. And when James Franco asked him years later, why did you write it? He said, James, some dumbass reason. And what makes the novel uh, Child of God actually kind of weird, we could sit and talk all day about the weird things, but like McCarthy's descriptions are insane because this novel is only, it's actually a novella. It's, it's only like 33,000 words. So at some point, like Lester has a body of a girl on his back. Like I said, these aren't really major spoilers. And like McCarthy describes it as he's carrying the frog. There's a scene in Child of God where Lester is stalking a man. And then when he finally comes to murder him, he's like wearing lingerie and his scalped Buffalo Bill style. One of the women, uh, one of the, excuse me, he's wearing a scalped wig from one of the women that he's murdered. And McCarthy really captures a very matter-of-fact tone throughout this entire novel, which just makes it really creepy. And so I'm not going to sit and fetishize necrophilia and talk about all that in detail, but that's obviously weird. And if I've missed anything so far, let me know in the comments down below. And so such re and let me just say this, this cover is so fire. This might be the best first edition cover of any McCarthy novel once you've read the you know, once you've read such re. It really just kind of captures the vibes. And so not too many heart any any big spoilers here, but at the start of the novel, we encounter this character, Harrogate, who is in prison because he was a moonlight melon mounter, which basically means that he was having sex with watermelon and got caught doing so, which is more just hilarious. Like Sutri is a hilar hilarious book than weird, but it's still it's weird. But what makes Sutri so bizarre, you guys, is that it was actually the first piece of writing McCarthy started to work on outside of his short stories, A Drowning Incident and A Wake for Susan. And he hadn't even finished college yet before he started writing it. But Sutri is highly autobiographical. McCarthy at one point calls Sutri the poet because McCarthy viewed himself as a poet. But a lot of the events, a lot of the individuals are actually real people. Like for instance, Johnny Knoxville's father is a character in Sutri. And even before Cormac McCarthy met Augusta Britt, the underage woman he had sex with, he had already written in the Wanda scene. And McCarthy describes Wanda in a way that would make it appear that she was in the late stages of puberty, but not all the way through puberty yet, which can put her age anywhere. But he used a descriptor of her as a girl child. And Sutri actually felt bad about this relationship. He felt guilty and weird about what was happening between them. And what's odd about Sutri's character, because I have a Sutri t-shirt, I do and sell Cormac McCarthy merch, everybody, if you were interested. But like my art for that shirt is a Zen you know, reincarnation symbol with a trout in the middle. And McCarthy, who was studying Zen and Eastern mysticism at this time, I think infused a lot of kind of the Zen, I don't really care elements into Sutri. And I think McCarthy embodied a lot of those elements himself. M McCarthy in high school was very laissez faire and didn't care. And when people reflect on him during that time, he just really didn't do anything. He was that dude that was smart and talented, but just didn't really care about what was going on and had the very successful siblings. And when you look at his life and his lack of money and his career choice and even him not finishing college, one credit short, it's just kind of like, you know what, whatever, just go with the flow. We do know McCarthy did psychedelics. We know that he lived in San Francisco and was interested in the beat movement. And so that kind of mentality would make sense. And not to justify McCarthy, well, I don't have to justify anything because it's a fiction novel and it doesn't matter, but it feels a lot of the time that Sutri just gets into these situations and he's just like, you know what, let's just go with the flow. I'm a fisherman. Another small detail is that Wanda's father, um, Reese, you know, it's been speculated before that he was actually having sex with Wanda too. And when Sutri and Reese go to a brothel, the women that they are described as being with are child whores. And so, like I said, I don't know what that terminology means to McCarthy, but I guess in my 2024 reflection, a child whore 
you know, to me, you know, 13 to 16. And what makes Sutri weird is that it starts with the suicide. There are images of fetuses and dead children all throughout the novel. I mean, at the beginning, in that beautiful session, it says stinking forms of fotal children. There are condoms. There is, uh, excuse me, Sutri's abandonment of his first wife. And we got more weird stuff to talk about. And there's a, I mean, not to go full cataclysmic here on you guys, but there are so many doubles in Sutri that it's insane. There's like Sutri and then there's anti, anti-Sutri. And in the earlier drafts of Sutri, uh, Wanda is actually pregnant, which is insane. And that's why on page 358, he puts her ear, he puts his ear to the, her womb and said that, and uh, he says that he could hear the hiss of meteorites through the blind stellar depths. And so I think he just left that in there because in the scene right before Wanda dies, he meets two twin possum hunters and Sutri actually has a dead twin brother. And so that's like anti, anti Sutri. And out there, these hunters perform this trick. And then when they look at him, they say brother. And so, you know, that could mean a lot of things, but it could also, it could be a reference to his dead brother, but it could also be a reference to the child in Wanda's womb that in the next scene dies, which is a very odd, very odd, uh, series of events. And once again, Albert Erskine was very much against this whole Wanda scene. He wanted McCarthy to cut this scene completely. And what's interesting also about Sutri is that it really is a very personal and spiritual novel. And it is about kind of Sutri's failed attempts to achieve. And I really can't think there's any spoilers for Sutri, even though I'm not releasing two major ones, because there really is no plot in the novel. Anyway, it's about such a spiritual evolution, and it took McCarthy until 1978 to finish the novel. It took him moving to El Paso, being in a relationship with Augusta Britt, and going through all these different things to kind of feel like he had made this jump in this evolution and distance himself from Knoxville and a lot of his like earlier problems, his family trauma, his trauma with his first wife. He's working out out all of that, in my opinion, in Sutri. And so we also have in Sutri the whole joy section where he's in a relationship with a prostitute and like all that is very, very odd sexually because she's going off and sleeping with other men and McCarthy buys a Jaguar, excuse me, Sutri buys a Jaguar and that all ends. Erskine also wanted to cut all of that. Then at the end of the novel, and I, I guess I could say slight spoiler here, Sutri is most likely raped by the witch. And so there are a lot of weird scenes in Corvat McCarthy novels, everyone. And if you guys want to read Sutri with me, read All the Pretty Horses with me and read other books with me, I run a Cormac McCarthy course and a Cormac McCarthy book club. And in like a week and a half or so, we are going to start reading more Cormac McCarthy novels. We are always reading a a Cormac McCarthy novel. And so even if you see this five years in the future, I will be continuing to post and host book clubs over there. The link to that is down in the description below. And I would love to see you guys over there. And if not, I will see you very soon in my next McCarthy video.